Hello there. My name is Fatima Loren Dreyer, Executive Director of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. We are a national organization that stands up hospital-based violence intervention programs. We currently serve over 85 cities in the United States and abroad. We are proud members of the Fund Peace Coalition, which is working closely with the Biden administration to fight for a $5 billion commitment to community violence intervention. I am so pleased to be joined by our esteemed panel, Michael Dowling and, and Mark Harris, excuse me, Mark Harrison. Uh, to start, I'd like to ask each one of you to share more about uh, the work your system is already doing to address gun violence. Uh, Michael, I'll have you start. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, let me also say a special thanks to you for everything that you're doing. And um, uh, to Mark Harrison, I want to say um, hi to Mark. Uh, a wonderful leader, um, a terrific CEO in a wonderful, wonderful health system at Intermountain. It's just an absolute pleasure to be with you for, again for a few moments. Um, I remember the moment back in, the, in uh, August of 2019, I remember sitting at home and uh, uh, watching the television when there were uh, accounts of the major uh, shootings in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio that killed kill quite a number of people. And uh, at that moment, I remember saying to myself, you know, this is an absolute tragedy. It's absolutely extraordinary that this is going on in our society at this time. Um, and, but then the second part of my question was, well, what should a place like Northwell be doing? We just can't sit by and say, this is okay. So at that point, we decided, I decided that we were going to uh, try to do something and that we have to broaden the, the definition of health and a gun violence is a public health issue and we should therefore, therefore do something. So one of the first things I did was I took a, a full page ad in the New York Times to basically say this is a public health issue that requires the, in, the involvement of large health systems like Northwell. We have an obligation and responsibility here. We just can't sit on the sidelines. You've got to be in the arena, in the game and, and doing whatever you can do, especially because large systems like Northwell and Intermountain, we have lots of influence, uh, we have lots of employees, we're out in the communities all over the place, um, and uh, we have a very, very large footprint. So we created a center for gun violence prevention pretty well soon after that, and I was very fortunate to, uh, to put in the person in charge of that, Dr. Chetan Satya, who um, has done a remarkable job with regard to education, promotion, encouraging all of our own employees inside the organization to get involved. And there's a lot that needs to be done here. Obviously, there are a whole variety of things that can be done, and we're working on all of these. And I do think that we need to make a, a, a basic list of all of those things that if we accomplished them, we could make an actual difference. And, you know, we need to develop this roadmap. We can talk about what we're doing, but we need to develop a consistent roadmap that we can all follow. But I'm delighted um, uh, to, to, to be with Mark Harrison and uh, uh, f let me maybe uh, uh, you know turn it over to him and have him add what he thinks about this topic at the moment Mark well um thank you Fatima thanks for moderating and Michael it's so good to see you um, we have to hopefully next year this will be in person I miss you my friend that's our that's our goal to have it next year in person yeah so um, I, I couldn't agree more with um, what you said, and I love the proactive approach that um, you've taken leading, um, leading Northwell. At Intermountain, like you, we've been activists on this front, but we really treat this as a, as a public health problem. I know that you know, many folks wanna take a political angle or lens on, um, on gun violence for us, you know, the facts are really pretty stark. Uh, you know, if you look at um, gun violence in the U.S., in the last 50 years, more Americans have died um, from, by gun violence than all the soldier, American soldiers who have ever died in any war. But that's just a, an unbelievably horrible statistic. And um, it, it actually broke my heart listening to the students just before us the fact that they have to worry about this day in, day out, um, they should be worried about getting good grades and playing sports and making friends and going on dates and doing all the things that high school students are supposed to be doing and have to worry about gun violence and um, 
you know, uh, whether they could get hurt in their school is just a, a really a terrible thing. Um, that said, uh, nationally, two thirds of, um, of gun deaths are actually suicides. Um, and in Utah, as it happens, 85% of gun deaths are suicides. And so this is really a behavioral health issue. Um, and this is an issue uh, that I think health systems are uniquely um, well designed to begin to address. And um, what's beautiful about it is not political, it's just about service to other people, which is what we do every day at scale and across broad geography. So I'll probably pause right there and um, see where Fatima wants to take us on this conversation. Really appreciate uh, your comment. Gun violence is the leading cause of death uh, for African-American boys and men and the second leading cause of death for Latinos. How do you envision the role health systems can play serving black and Latino communities who are disproportionately impacted? What do you see as gold standard opportunities for partnership with communities who've been deeply impacted by violence? And Mark, I'll, I'll actually have you start. Thank you. Um, so as you know, we actually have, um, we do not have a large um, African-American footprint in our tradition uh, uh, population or our traditional footprint in Utah. Although we've entered Idaho, uh, we've entered Nevada in the last couple of years, where there is a very substantial Black population, but we have lots of Latinos um, across um, the area we work, and um, we're actually addressing this in much the same way as we're addressing things like um, uh, vaccine vaccination disparities. We're using community health workers, and we're working with um, private public partnerships, uh, identifying community organizations, community leaders, whether it's churches or schools or sports teams or uh, uh, business organizations. And we are working with the folks who actually have credibility in their own communities to try and arm them. I guess I gotta be careful saying arm them, um, prepare them to, uh, to work with their neighbors so that we can keep them safe. And one of the most effective things that we've done uh, in conjunction with these uh, communities is actually give out trigger locks. You know, we, we know that um, Impulsivity is a big issue, particularly when it comes to um, uh, self-harm, but also in harming other people and making things just a little more difficult um, in the form of trigger locks actually can have enormous impact in terms of outcome. Uh, so I think at, to date, we've actually distributed about 30,000 trigger locks. Uh, we've done that often in conjunction with uh, primary care physicians, community groups, um, including um, all manner of um, different uh, demographics. Thank you so much. Very powerful to lift up the, the role and the credibility of community health workers. Michael, I'll turn things over to you. Well, I think, um, you know, we're in those communities, especially in our geographic area here, and um, we, we have to be out in those communities, working with the local leadership in those communities, which we're doing, working with the local pastors, working with local CBO agencies, uh, providing as much support and help as we possibly can, sharing information, educating local people, having them educate us, because what happens in many of these local communities is different uh, based upon the community, so we need to have them tell us what things that they need to do. But um, we should be providing as much employment opportunity as possible to those communities. We should be expanding mental health and behavioral health uh, services in those communities. Um, we should obviously be supporting the local healthcare organizations in those places. Um, uh, we, as we are doing at Northwell, uh, we are doing a screening program at all of our emergency departments, uh, which is funded by NIH. Uh, so asking questions about people who come to the emergency department, and they come m many from those communities, about the potential dangers with regard to gun violence in their communities, what they're experiencing. Uh, whether they have experienced it in the past, what is, what, what is situations that we need to do if there are guns in the homes, how it is we provide uh, some protective devices for them to make sure that those guns are safe. So it's a whole combination of issues with those lo with local communities. And uh, I can say that the, the response has been absolutely phenomenal. But part of it also, I will add, is that we have to continue to educate all of our own staff all of our own physicians. Uh, we have about 78,000 employees, uh, so we need, a, we need 
much more education among our own employees about this issue as a public health issue because our employees work in those communities. They come from right. those communities. The more they know about what it is, uh, what the problems are, and how it is we can help and how they can continue to promote the continuing education, all of that will make a huge, huge difference. And as, I, as I've already said, we have, we have gained and we've got a lot of support from those communities and from local pastors in those communities using local churches and engaging with the schools, having uh, lots of educational programs in the schools. And as Mark mentioned, we heard from those students a few moments ago, I've met with those students and with many others, and the more education we can do in the schools, with the students, with the parents, and, in, the, and in, in, in many cases with law enforcement that are working with us to provide ongoing collaborative support. All of, the, all of these things make a huge, huge difference. So it's a continuing effort. And I believe if we maintain and persist, and, and persist on it, we will eventually make a difference. It's all about education and providing services and providing other opportunities for people in those communities to potentially follow a different path. Very powerful, thank you for that. Um, Michael, you, you opened by sharing the, the, the influence that health system leaders have, uh, and, and at the hobby we say this is, this is not a moment, this is a movement. <clears throat> I'm really curious, um, as you uh, converse with health leaders across the country, what barriers do you hear from them in terms of uh, their own buy-in to prioritizing gun violence prevention uh, within their systems, or at least approaching it from a systemic perspective well that is good news here Fatima. that's really good news because when uh, a couple of years ago I reached out to quite a number of health systems and uh, didn't get a lot of uh, immediate response positive response people were really worried and I had people say to me well uh, you know you're, you're a healthcare organization uh, you you focus on keep taking care of illness etc so this is not necessarily your lane and my argument is that absolutely this is our lane um, and that is, you know, impossible to argue the opposite. Um, but over the last couple of years, we now have hundreds of local healthcare organizations that have joined a collaborative that we uh, initiated a couple of years ago, a learning collaborative. Many are on this program today. Uh, so more and more receptivity. That does not mean that there are not organizations before doing great work in their local communities. Um, but it was kind of, it was, uh, it, it, I remember in one particular instance, I remember talking to a large trade association that happened to be about 50 hospitals in the room. And when I talked about this, they were looking at, people looking at me saying, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, whether this is an area we, we want to get involved in. It's political. Uh, many of our board members uh, are gun owners. Uh, many of them are very conservative with regard to gun issues. Um, some of them will argue that uh, what you're all about is the Second Amendment. You want to take, you want to deal specifically with gun ownership in the Second Amendment. And I had to continually explain that was not the focus here. The focus here is this is about gun safety. This is about protection. This is about prevention. And once you got that message more and more across, more and more people uh, got engaged. But you know, there have been people like Mark Harrison from Intermountain has been involved in this for an awful long time. So when I look back over the last three years and I compare where we are today vis-a-vis -vis where, we where we were three years ago, I see, I see dramatic progress, especially within the healthcare field. That's good news. And that, that's, that's, that adds, that's an additive thing that will help us continue the, the, the journey and continue focusing on this. And as I said at the very, very beginning of the introduction, not being very resilient and not getting pessimistic about it. So we're in a much better place today than we were before, I believe. And over time, all of that collective activity and those partnerships will bear positive fruit. I'm absolutely convinced about that. Well, let's see if Mark shares your view. So I'm hearing the theme of momentum. There's tremendous interest. Uh, there may have been people who were resistant at first, but they're, they're, you're seeing more people join the fight. Mark, what do you think? You know, um, our country's pretty polarized right now, and um, people are angry at each other a lot, and they want to back each other into corners and take um, 
very binary approaches, good, bad, for guns, against guns, and um, it's just not practical. And, it, and vilifying and demonizing your neighbors doesn't take you very far. Um, you just end up with people who are, you know, when anybody's backed into a corner, they fight. And that, that we don't need more fighting. At Intermountain, we've, um, we've really worked hard to build bridges, um, not pick fights. And probably the most effective bridge that we've built is actually with a, a large gun lobby um, here in the Intermountain West. And, you know, as, as Michael pointed out, whether you um, are really pro-gun ownership or not, nobody wants a kid to kill themselves because of access to a gun. And uh, we've really worked together on whether it's trigger locks or education in the schools or media campaigns. We've got a $2 million campaign that we launched uh, in conjunction with others to educate people about the need for gun safety um, and to de-escalate people when they're distressed to make sure that an impulsive event doesn't occur. So I think we're trying to build bridges more than walls, and this has actually been a unlikely. I, when I first heard about this potential partnership, I was um, not terribly optimistic, but guess what? Um, these are good people, and um, we've got more in common than we have uh, different between us, and I think we've been quite successful. Incredibly powerful stories. I'm, I think that it's uh, remarkable that if the frame is healthcare, if the frame is uh, prevention, um, it becomes a bipartisan opportunity for collaboration. And I, I think that's always exciting, particularly because we're in a polarized uh, country at this moment, to your point, Mark. So I really appreciate your lifting that up. So we are entering a new um, era, I think, in, in terms of our uh, the public's understanding of gun violence and gun violence prevention. Um, but we unfortunately have had decades of neglect, particularly in understanding research, uh, advancing research uh, that supports our understanding of, of guns, uh, our understanding of um, people who are impacted by violence every day, and understanding it truly as a public health issue. Um, what do you see um, as your role in advancing a research agenda? How do you partner with communities? How do you engage stakeholders uh, in the corporate world, law enforcement, uh, faith leaders, uh, to really understand um, opportunities to advance uh, a research agenda? Well, let me just take uh, just a, uh, an attempt at this at the beginning. You know, I, the, the, the restriction on research has loosened up a little bit. Um, and uh, this is why, for example, we got uh, the money from the NIH to stop doing uh, research uh, in our emergency departments and working with the communities on this. And I, I do think um, that one of the agenda items coming out of this would be for the, some of the large health systems, along with many of the CBOs around this uh, meeting today, to coalesce around a research agenda and lobby very, very hard uh, for, um, for Congress and others and the NIH to actually put more money into research. And, 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 and maybe, um, uh, you know, with the issue we're doing, for example, in the emergency rooms and having quite a number of other organizations do the same thing so we can compare and contrast our, the outcomes over time as to what, is, what the benefits of that can be. So I think that we can collaborate around a research agenda here. Uh, maybe this is something Mark and I can do subsequent to this and lead a kind of coalition of others uh, to lobby for more research dollars and maybe coalesce and combine, and, and combine our efforts on doing similar research projects in the various areas so we can see what kind of a difference it makes. Uh, so uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic about the research agenda now than I was at the beginning. As you know, that there was a complete restriction on being able to, to uh, get money from, uh, uh, from the government to do the research, but that's a little bit different now. So um, I, I, I do think that has also improved and gives a little bit of ray of hope for the future. Thank you. Mark, it sounds like you've got uh, some additional uh, uh, work you'll be doing following this with, uh, with Mike. Well, I, I always <laughs> like to give Mark work, yeah. So. To, know, to know Michael is to work for Michael, so I'm, <laughs> I'm actually quite used to, quite used to that. Uh, we actually have a really nice example um, in the state of Utah from 2016. So in 2016, um, the Utah State Legislature passed House Bill um, 440, which called for a study around 
gun violence and suicidality. And it, um, I think the work that came out of it provided some clarity and some common purpose, which is great. Um, maybe the most important thing is that it created a, a platform for dialogue and um, it activated people um, from all over the political spectrum in the interest of keeping um, our neighbors safe. And I think it's really a good thing. Really powerful. I'm going to actually punctuate the point. Uh, there's a real opportunity to uh, engage in dialogue through research. And, and I think some of the community participatory methods uh, that we see many gun violence prevention researchers engaging, uh, leveraging uh, the voices of survivors uh, and, and other stakeholders is, is really critical. So really appreciate that point, Mark. Uh, it's going to take a, a lot of stakeholder engagement to really advance an agenda and actually encourage people to, to stay engaged. Um, we've got uh, just a few minutes left, um, and I wanted to, you know, uh, encourage you to, to, you know, share a bit about what keeps you in this fight. Um, you, uh, Michael, you mentioned resilience. Uh, it takes tremendous resilience to stay in. Uh, we are, you know, dealing with uh, a number of, um, uh, uh, Mark, you mentioned this being put in a corner, right? They're, they're very easy with this particular issue um, to uh, unfortunately uh, get a lot of resistance. And so what keeps you uh, motivated? Um, any personal uh, connection to the issue that we should be aware of? How, how would you encourage others um, who might feel discouraged um, in our fight? Well, I, 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 being in healthcare, uh, you, you, you've got to you've got to be inspirational and you've got to be optimistic and positive. Uh, you've always got to look uh, down the road to say that things can always get better. I think that there is inherent in the DNA of most healthcare leaders is this long-term view that it takes time to do anything. If you, even if you look at public health. Uh, and what uh, the advances that have been made over the decades in public health. Uh, you know, I, I was reading a book recently about the cholera epidemic in, in London in 1854 when, you know, you could argue that a lot of the public health issues began back then. That's a long, that's a long journey. I remember, you know, when Ralph Nader was out years and years ago talking about seat belts and cars and, and airbags and everybody said, that is crazy. Nobody is going to uh, put those in the cars. It, it'll cost too much. To, uh, uh, the car manufacturers won't do it. Uh, it is, uh, you know, I remember people talking about the fact that he was, uh, you know, off the rails. You know, well, look today, you cannot buy a car today without a safety, a seat belt and airbags, etc. You could not possibly do it. I think about smoking. You know, obviously, there's still a long journey to go, but, uh, you know, as you know, I'm Irish. I grew up in Ireland and everybody smoked. Today, you cannot smoke in any internal location in Ireland, in any business, in, 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 in indoors, you cannot smoke in, in a public place. I, almost unimaginable years ago. So things will happen, things can happen. Uh, and so I think we got to think of those kinds of examples and understand that uh, this is a, a, you know, an epidemic. People are dying, people are getting gravely ill, unbelievable behavioral health trauma, et cetera, et cetera. So it will change. It will improve. Uh, we're a better society than this. Um, United States should not be known as the place in the United in the world that has this unique circumstance. Uh, I do believe strongly that it will it will take time. So I'm uh, yeah. I, you can't give up and. Um, and I don't believe that uh, those of us in healthcare will give up, and those of us in the CBO organizations out there and all of the other people on this, in this program today will give up. So uh, I'm confident uh, that um, we just have to be optimistic. There is a better future out there. We owe it to our children. We owe it to the kids that were on the program right before us. We owe it to them because for those of us in leadership positions, what we're all about is building better futures. You cannot build better futures if you have an epidemic of gun violence all around you all the time. And that should give us hope and optimism.
appreciate it. Mark, your final words. So um, I, I don't usually do it, but I'll, I'll quote Joseph Stalin right now, who said, um, a million deaths um, are a statistic, one death is a, tra is a tragedy, right? And um, we need to remember, and I have the advantage of being a pediatric ICU doctor and taking care of a number of kids who are killed by gun violence, either by their own hands or by other people, and to see the devastation it wreaks on a family, that just has to end. Um, and I think treating this as a public health problem and working together as neighbors, I think we can make a difference. Powerful words. I thank both of you for your leadership. And let's continue to encourage others to lead on this and, and as we end optimistically indeed see a change in this country. Thank you so much for your, your time and uh, looking forward to the rest of our, our sessions today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.